Hi, I'm Patrick Phelps. Uh, I thought it might be worth taking a look at what happens when property or land rights uh, clash with the desire to protect what remains of this country's native uh, habitats and wildlife, aka indigenous biodiversity. Central government, as you may be aware, is putting the squeeze on local governments around the country to map, identify and protect what they're calling significant natural areas or SNAs. In plainer words, to protect areas of native bush and scrub on private property. All land-based industries are going to be constrained or at the very least impacted by this farming, property development, mining, the lot. This is going to particularly affect areas like the West Coast, the East Coast, Northland, Southland, Nelson, Tasman, basically areas that haven't cleared every last tree. In many other parts of the country there's simply not that much left to protect. The Resource Management Act does allow for some regional discretion at a local government level, but when the central government you know, deems it necessary, they can implement what's, what are called uh, national policy statements um, to try and achieve consistency around the country. This is kind of on the back burner, I think, I can't really tell, um, due to a bit of backlash from some iwi, particularly up north, uh, but the long-standing issue, I guess, the, the clash of ideals between property rights and protecting indigenous biodiversity, that's not going to go away. In terms of how we got here, about 800 years of human beings being humans in Aotearoa uh, has caused the extinction of, I think, well over 50, maybe into um, 60 different animal species, including 45 species of birds. The combined impact of, you know, a couple of centuries of early hunter-gatherers um, clearing the landscapes for hunting and other reasons with, with fire, along with the later impacts of um, widespread conversion of, I guess, forest and wetland for agricultural purposes, probably a bit of native logging as well. The combined impact of that has meant that vegetation cover, native vegetation cover, has gone from about 80% of the country's land to about 25% today. Since the Conservation Act was passed though in the late 1980s, a third of the country has been protected and managed by the Department of Conservation. On the west coast that's a far greater um, proportion with about 82-84% somewhere there, thereabouts um, under docks management. That being said though, there is probably about a fifth of um, remaining native bush that's um, privately owned along with half of the remaining wetlands in the country under private ownership. It would also be fair to say though that the conservation estate is largely skewed towards higher altitude, um, steeper, cooler, less fertile areas and that these forests that are in the conservation estate don't support anywhere near as wide a range of species as the lowland, I guess, coastal forests you'll find, or those on valley floors, um, just doesn't support the wide range of species, I guess, as you get, you know, closer to sea level, basically. And it's these areas of privately owned forest and wetland that the government's trying to preserve by requiring local councils around the country at their own expense to map, identify and protect significant natural areas that happen to be on private land. One of the more vocal groups that's pushing for this is Forest and Bird. I had a look on their website to see what they had to say about it and um, one, of the, one of the articles that I found is quite telling in sort of terms of revealing what their sort of stance on it is or how they look at the issue. So um, one sentence here, the most important thing to recognise is that you have something special on your land that is worth protecting. Here at least the writer is acknowledging that the ecosystem belongs to the owner. You have something special on your land. To say it's worth protecting is fine, but according to whom? Well, to have a look at another sentence, um, where are we? Some of these places are all that is left. Most New Zealanders are keen to protect what remains, and as a property owner, you have a special opportunity to do this. Here the writer acknowledges that um, this is a decision, I guess, that's being made by most New Zealanders. That's why it's being done by the government on behalf of the population. But they seem to be implying that it's the landowner that should carry the can. This seems to me to be a case of socialising the gains, but then privatising the cost or the losses. It is worth a look at what other more considered environmental voices have had to say about this subject. The Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, Simon Upton, um, while supporting what the government's trying to do, protecting, you know, native habitats and wildlife, um, has warned of the potential for SNAs to create social, economic and cultural costs to landowners around the country. He's stressed that one thing that is vital to this process is the wholehearted support of the day-to-day -day custodians of the land in effect, the owners. QE2 National Trust is an organisation that has worked with 
uh, landowners um, on a voluntary basis to secure the protection of about 190,000 hectares of private land around the country. The Trust has pointed out that setting land aside does come at a cost to landowners, not just the opportunity cost of retiring the land, but then the ongoing management cost if the biodiversity values are to be genuinely maintained and enhanced. You can't just lock an area up and hope for the best. You have to have ongoing management and someone's got to pay for that. Um, this obviously includes fencing areas off from livestock potentially, um, but then also ongoing management and control of invasive or introduced um, animal predators and pests, um, invasive plants or weeds, somebody's got to pay for that. When dealing with landowners, the process needs to be collaborative and beneficial to both parties. There are funding models for this, so alongside QE2 there is also the Nature Heritage Fund. Both of these uh, organisations receive a little money from the government through the Department of Conservation each year to put towards um, the protection of biodiversity on private land, but it's bugger all. Between QE2 and the Nature Heritage Fund, about 540,000 hectares of private land around New Zealand have been protected in perpetuity. This year's budget uh, has allocated about $7 million, I think, um, between the two groups, along with another $21 million um, towards the protection of biodiversity on Māori-owned land around the country, and that is to say land that is owned collectively by different iwi groups nationwide. I'm not going to go into all the things that the government's spent money on that I think has questionable value, because that's a pretty long list, but there are uh, there's ample evidence, I guess, that there are plenty of things that the government, on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, seems to place higher value upon than the protection of biodiversity on private land, otherwise they would just put more money towards it. But ask yourself, if you were to wake up tomorrow as the owner of 300 hectares of land anywhere in New Zealand, what 300 hectares would benefit you most financially? 300 hectares of central Auckland, you know, um, a mixture of commercial and residential property, I suspect that would make you one of the richest people in the country if you were to own those 300 hectares, uh, or perhaps 300 hectares of pasture and the Waikato, I mean, yeah, aside from the early starts and the cowpoo, you'd probably be doing okay. Um, moving down another step, I guess, you could own 300 hectares of uh, pine plantation in the Nelson Marlborough area. I mean, it's better than nothing, um, but then probably at the bottom of the pile on a dollar for dollar basis would be owning 300 hectares of bush and wetland somewhere on the west coast, maybe in South Westland, that you could look at but not touch or do anything with, basically. In a joint submission on this policy, uh, the three district councils and the West Coast Regional Council argued that the tidiest way of doing this is to just come up with a fair compensation package for affected landowners. The argument goes that if the protection of areas of forest and wetland um, are of great interest or concern for the nation, then the Crown should pay for that and purchase them or at the least compensate landowners um, in the nation's interest. For most landowners, land is their largest asset if not their only one. Um, if that land has potential to be um, say farmed or developed you know, into, into housing or um, mined and then that landowner decides to forego that um, opportunity or that potential at quite a significant cost, you know, possibly tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars. Um, should that landowner alone shoulder the cost or should society you know, pay them out so to speak? In terms of what's significant and what's not, you will find a division of opinion among ecologists. And once you spread that out to wider society you'll find even more division. I'm not um, qualified to say what's significant or what's not. The only thing I would say is wherever we decide to set the bar, however low or high, wherever we decide to set the bar for what's significant, um, I think it's quite simple. If it's worthy of protection, then it's worth paying for. But if it's not worth paying for, then it's not worth protecting. Anything else is just shortchanging landowners and communities who up until now haven't put everything under pavement or pasture or pine and actually making them, you know, poorer for it. And to me that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Anyway, thanks for watching.